Good evening and welcome on a Wednesday night to Generation Movie. My name is J.W. Caldwell. Uh, proud to be with my host, my co-host of the show um, from Film Buff Online and so many other ventures, including like films in, in, in giant like contention in all these like little festivals. Um, Rich Drees, how are you this evening, Rich? I'm doing great, J.W. Always a pleasure to see you uh, and sit around and shoot the shit about movies um this is my second podcast of the evening by the way um earlier, you're on fire oh my god earlier, usually i episode four of um the film scribes which is the philadelphia film critic circle podcast um and it had a kind of a group review and discussion of the new m night Shyamalan film which comes out tomorrow evening and then we talked about uh, the people's joker which i think we brought i brought up and mentioned to you a couple of weeks back we're talking a little bit about that. It's, um, uh, you know, this underground non-licensed DC project from a, um, from a, an aspiring filmmaker, but also a very good filmmaker, a young filmmaker, uh, who is also trans, right? That's the, yes. the deal. Um, and it's just, it's got, it's got a lot of people up, up in uh, arms, but also a lot of people kind of excited because it's a new take on a character that's been seen a lot on screen lately. <laughs> I don't know if you take so much as an appropriation of certain uh, symbolisms and caricatures to tell a very different type of story and one that's very personal to the uh, filmmaker. Yeah, so, but interesting. And but apparently. I, I, I wish more people could see this movie. I wish I could see this movie again because there's so much more about it. Well, and the, the way you saw it is this really interesting take. It's these underground screenings that are occurring all over the country. Um, since the film got booted, I think it was, did it get booted out of the Toronto Film Fest or? It had one screening at Toronto. Then Vera Drew, the director, received a letter that was not a cease and desist, but a kind of a really strongly worded, we would prefer that you didn't kind of a thing. <laughs> a cool it letter, more of a cool it than get out of Dodge, just cool it. Um, but yeah, I mean, these. really pulled out of all the other film festivals that she was already in with the exception of one but that was because that other film festival had already dropped her because that film festival was very tight with Warner brothers. Well, and, and but like I said, this is more of a gorilla, a gorilla thing where you get invited to a private screening. It's like, it's like the film equivalent of a speakeasy almost. Oh, um, yes, yes. But the interesting thing there is it is, you know, property from a licensed DC property mm -hmm. and DC's having a big week sort of, big. <laughs> um, Monday, they had a, a you. You just had a film buff online article about where the DC universe is headed under uh, James Gunn, who is a jumping over from Marvel, all things Marvel, and you know apparently learning everything he's learned from Kevin Feige. And DC now has a coordinated person to keep everything in sync with a and coordinated plan. A, a plan you mean a plan not just taking properties and just throwing them out there and just making uh willy-nilly movies with a bunch of the most famous characters in the history of uh, comic books in the world like a, a an actual functional plan from from Warner Brothers in DC I, mm -hmm. I'm uh I'm in shock 
Shock. I mean, I'm wearing a Superman shirt tonight. For our first 10 minutes, are usually devoted to news. So let's talk about this. Your Film Buff uh, Online uh, article, right? And to push a little bit, um, you talked about all these new projects. The first of which will be a, a movie, a, re, a rebirth of Superman called Superman Legacy. Um, no Henry Cavill. That's already been decreed from uh, the high the high and mighty gun, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, it's going to be a much younger version of Superman. Um, we don't know who's cast yet. We just know that there's a plan in place for this next Superman movie. Yeah. Are you excited about the direction we're headed with DC? I'm excited by what's uh, being hinted at is going to be their overall eight to 10 year plan. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of hitting a lot of the core bases for DC. We're going to get a Superman movie. We're going to get our Batman movie. We're going to get a um, TV series that delves into the history of Themyscira, um, the home uh, land of Wonder Woman. So, you know, there's our Trinity right there, kind of dealt with. Um, we're, we're getting gonna... a Lantern show, but it's a refurbished Lantern show. Yeah. It's, so the no, Berlanti show is gone. What uh, Greg Berlanti was developing. Um, it's going to be kind of, they said true detectives, but with, you know, space cops on Earth. I'm in. Uh, I, I'm also a longtime Green Lantern fan, so that's no problem with me. Um, we also are getting uh, some things like The Authority, um, which is interesting. We're seeing a Swamp Thing. Um, a man, uh, uh, we're getting the further adventures of Amanda Waller, who runs the Suicide Squad. Uh, well, and also is by far the most tenured DC cast member at this point. Yeah. Viola Davis is an Oscar winner and also somebody that just happens to show up in DC, in many a DC movie, often for no reason. <laughs> just just to show up and be like, I'm Amanda Waller. Do you forget about me? Um, and so I think it's an interesting thing. The authority is, of course, like a less moral, a less moral version of the Justice League. <laughs> and then <laughs> The, the Swamp Thing thing is interesting to me for Gunn because Gunn, you know, if you don't know anything about Gunn except that he's made Guardians of the Galaxy and a couple other things, Gunn started out in horror films. So if you're giving me Gunn with a outcast Swamp Thing slash ho- real horror film, um, as the original Swamp Thing was in kind of the 80s, right? The 80s horror film. like Because it's like a horror film. Yeah. Um. You know, has Adrian Barbeau, has, you know, it's it's a, it's a horror film. Mm-hmm. If you're giving me a gun-directed uh, Swamp Thing, then I'm in. Right? Um, a couple things before we get going. Also, we're, we're, we're knee-deep already. Yeah. But we got we to gotta touch base on things. A lot of stuff going on with this, this network we're on. This oh. wonderfully wacky and wild network. Uh, the Indie Escape Network. Uh, you can subscribe on YouTube. We have a wonderful YouTube channel. All of our shows are now indexed on YouTube. And you can also get them in podcast form to be able to download them and just listen to them in your car or wherever you're headed. By all means, we're about 30 episodes in. There's a lot of stuff we talked about, mostly 1982. But now we're going to branch out and we're doing Bond films. Also, our network has this amazing Indie Escape Network Facebook page where you can find current polls, uh, links to the shows as they're happening live, like the end of the night. Um, you know, we have a, a couple new shows being added this week. Uh, we have a new show with Wendy Zire, who is a famous voiceover artist. Um, and you know, it's a really nice eclectic group. We have Gabe on, on Tuesday nights. Um, we have CJ on Monday nights. We have all these different people getting involved. Brandon, you know, has been a little bit away, but is sorely missed, but you know, taking some time out. Um, and, but a lot of an eclectic mix of people. Uh, led by the incomparable Joe Ridgely and just kind of on a mission to do good things, um, you know, from a movie perspective, like finding out Indie Escape Artist Networks and just finding all these different places where you might have people that are are your tribe, right? That's kind of what we're looking for. Um, but, so comments also, as I jump in. Okay. Then, then I, I still have a couple of uh, more. Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm, we're not done okay. with that. I promise we're not. Um, uh, let's see. Sean uh, chimes in. Hey, JW and Rich. Hi, Sean. Thank you for joining us. 
Joe Ridgely, good evening, gentlemen. Congrats on the Rich on the Northeast Pennsylvania Film Fest election. That Thank is somebody you. that's actually – wow, I feel like Joe is, is now cyber-stalking us. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just – I didn't actually know – I knew it was that selection, but it was – it's also been um, – Eight years with Guild has also been elected to other film festivals as well. Terrific. Yes. Okay. Now I feel bad because Joe had more knowledge than I did. Um, and, also, and also, also, if I may toot my own horn here, um, our other short film, The Test, it was accepted at the uh, Block Island Film Festival uh, in Rhode Island. And so much, so much stuff means, going on. That means a lot to me because my mom was from Rhode from Rhode Island. So yeah, I, I know you I know that that was a major source of pride at this point um yeah. joe wrote i like the swamp thing second generation show wish north carolina didn't strip the tax credit yeah there was there were things going on in the second generation swamp thing show but i get a feeling gun is going to be very careful with the property uh camera gunner good evening friends here on facebook still banned on twitter <laughs> wow okay uh we we have banned folks that are that are that are fans um but like i said a lot of places to watch our network but overall this is an exciting this um, this thing with DC with gun, um, it, the press conference came across very well. Although, like, although guns dropping f bombs at major press conferences is not necessarily like that's immediately going to set people like, oh my god. Um, but you know, basically saying I I love the the initial concept, which is, hey, first generation of the DC films fucked up. They've been fucked up for a while, and all I can think of myself is. He's speaking to me because I feel the Snyderverse has been fucked up for a while. Yeah. So well, I would say after Snyder left, I prefer a lot of those films. Um, there's not a cohesive vision overall. And I was kind of fine with that, actually. I was fine with like Harley Quinn doing her thing and then Shazam's over here. And it didn't necessarily have to connect into a bigger story. Um well, and it could, but, there, but the lack of leadership is where the key is, right? For oh, yeah. them, like you can, and what they've already assigned in in this press conference, um, you know, one of the things that I like that Gunn has taken the control of is, hey, we know the Batman is going to be in an else world. We know that the Joker part do is going to be an else world, right? They're not going to be part of our overall vision universe but they're going to be part of things where people can be assured of a, a level of quality to them. At, but they're not going to be like Pattinson is not going to be meeting our Superman legacy guy. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, when you get into a press conference and DC has never been able to do this, well, like about a year, two years ago, right. When the Joker came out, when Joker came out, I shouldn't just call it the Joker. It was just Joker. When Joker came out, they're like, well, will this Joker ever get to like deal with Batman? I mean, but in that movie, Batman's a, a six-year-old. You know what I mean? Like, so there's yeah. all these questions that nobody could handle. And Gunn gets up and goes, these are the movies that are, these are the movies, television shows and animated shows are going to be part of our, our eight to 10 year vision, right? These movies are going to be made and they're not necessarily going to be part of the vision. They're going to be movies that are made by other filmmakers. There's at least a control to it that has not been there right and yes. i think that's the fi effect right that's gun going if you're giving me reins of these characters and this this universe i am going to try to run it the same way that fi is running his right where it's i know There's exactly what i'm the attention yeah one well, there there and that's the best part about it that's the best part about the for me that was the best part about the, the press conference mm -hmm is that we have all these different properties and we know exactly that there is a cohesive, a cohesive vision to it. True. And then I have these other side things that I know where people are excited about Batman two or whatever the hell they're going to call it. You know, Joker part two people are excited about cause you know, it's going to be a musical with Lady Gaga, you know, like it, there is excitement there. That's not necessarily encapsulated into guns vision of what DC is going to be. And I'm excited that he was able to at least get in the first press conference and go, hey, everything is fine. What I like about the breadth of these uh, different projects is I think it gives you a really good smorgasbord sampler of what DC Comics has to offer. You've got something kind of light in uh, Booster Gold. 
You've got, you know, the horror and supernatural element in Swamp Thing. You've got, you know, the science fiction and comic stuff with lanterns. You've got your standard, uh, you know, superhero stuff as well. And, um, you know, and that can range from, you know, hopeful, you know, a, I'm going to assume is a much more hopeful and optimistic Superman film to something a little grittier with what they were talking about with Supergirl, uh, Woman of Tomorrow. I like that. It, 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 I think one of the complaints leveled at Marvel is they're too much of the same tone. They have little variations, but they don't have a lot of variation. Whereas this at least suggests that there may be some, you know, wilder uh, tonal swings that will still somehow form that cohesive whole. And the idea that they're not backing away from the magic and supernatural stuff uh, in Swamp Thing um, at the same time doing science fiction, you know, with lanterns. Well, heavy science fiction. That, I mean, Lan Green Lanterns has potential to be a, a straight sci-fi show, right? Yeah. I mean... It, I'm just so, feeling that both of those elements are going to become imp more important as their story uh, becomes unfolds. more unveiled. And we well, and, and to be honest, is. you, you got to... I give Gunn a lot of credit because the first... So my vision with DC and my problems with DC have all come back to this, right? This across my chest, right? I am a I am a Donner Christopher Reeve Superman guy. I grew up watching the Donner films. I, I you know except for like ex, you know Superman one, Superman two are astounding pieces of comic book cinema, and then you you know you run into a lurch with Superman three and Superman: The Quest for Peace, obviously, but that vision of Superman, like that, that vision of, you know, truth, justice in the American way, whether it, it, it doesn't necessarily fit in our worldview right now. And, and that's okay. But I at least need your soup, my Superman to not be suicidal. Yeah. And I at least need my Superman um, to know what he's fighting for and to know that he's fighting for good. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that the great nuances like, I feel like the Christopher Reeve and, and Richard Donner Superman would know that Batman's not a bad guy from the get-go. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like yeah. I feel like Batman versus Superman fighting and just Superman, Henry Cavill, and him going at it and just, like, midway through. And the only thing that stops, you know, stops him from killing Batman is, like, what, Martha? One Martha comment? Or, you know, Batman from killing Superman? Um, you know, it's just one of those things where it's confusion and just... Superman's confused and, and, and all through Man of Steel, he's like, he, I, I will tell you point blank, my feelings on this. And they've always been the same way. The mistake with Pac Kent's death is an irrevocable sin that I think James Gunn looks at and goes, I can fix that. I can fix that in two script pages. It's like, name that tune. I can fix that, that script problem in two script pages um, because, you know, we've talked about, you and I have talked about this offline and online, I think, but the idea that Superman, the reason Pa Kent dies in the comics and the movies is that Superman has to realize he can't save everybody, no matter how great he is, no matter how wonderful he is, he can say he can't save everybody. Man of Steel, Pa Kent dies in a tornado that Superman can obviously save Pa Kent in and chooses not to. And so you put the you put this pressure down on this character and it just, it doesn't work for the character The it has to be, it has to be a heart attack. It has to be natural causes it has to be something where Superman goes, there are life and death choices that I make to save people every day. And it, it, you know, I'm going to use my powers for the right thing. And I just think if gun gets that right, picking Superman legacy to start this whole thing off leads me to believe gun got into a room and said, your biggest goddamn problem in this company is Superman. Mm -hmm. your biggest fucking problem is that you guys haven't been able to get the boy scout right. And the idea that you can't get the blue boy scout, right. Has crippled your fucking film division for, for 10 years. You just need, you get him right. And everything else will fall into place because the, the tension with Batman comes in and that Batman is a vigilante and Superman is mostly working with the government and <laughs> mostly working with cops. So, I wish James Gunn the best of luck. Let's see. We got a couple comments. Um, let's see. We got, let's see. 
think we start with Joe, actually. Yeah, Joe, right there. Sorry. I didn't see the whole gun thing yet. Did he say anything about these DCAU movies and shows? Not directly. Um, we are getting an animated um, seven or eight part uh, series of Creature Commandos, which Gunn has already written all of the episodes for. And that's exciting because, you know, they're kind of like, some, again, funky offbeat characters, monsters created to fight the Nazis. I'm in. Uh, um, well, and yeah, and then and the DC animated universe, they haven't, I, I don't, I don't think they're going to impact the new DC with, with gun. I think they're, that division kind of turns out everything they put out is usually pretty good. I mean, whether they continue to or not is, a, is an open question, I think, but if they do continue, I would imagine it would fall under that DC Elseworlds umbrella that, um, the These are stories Robert that take place, right? They take place. Joker, Teen Titans Go, and all those other projects that are still going to be going forward will fall under. Okay, let's see. Kathy chimes in. Supergirl Woman with Mal was an amazing comic. Yeah, I mean, and he's picking source material that's really interesting. Superman mm -hmm. Legacy, they're talking. Uh, one of the things on one of his Twitter feeds was that it was the Superman. I can't remember the title, but it's the Superman that everybody loved, where Superman was actually getting sick from the radiation of the sun. All-Star um, Superman. All Superman. I'm yeah. sorry. Couldn't remember it. Um, let's see. What else? Uh, I wish they would do a Death of Superman movie done correctly. You would have tears around the world. Yeah, but that's a wait and see kind of thing. You have to have a super, a very established Superman before you can do that. Yeah. Um, that my be the first movie. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, Donner made you believe a man can fly. Yes. Yes, Joe. Still, mm -hmm. the, still, the, and still amazing. Uh, still the best uh, Superman soundtrack of all time. Should use it every single time he's on screen. Yeah. Um, uh, Ken, Joe, one of them is Christian Commando, seven episode animated show in which Amanda Waller creates a black ops team out of monstrous prisoners. Gun wrote all the episodes of the first season. Wow, Ken, Ken's involved. Ken's involved in our show. Um, <laughs> and then Sean Gunn always has awesome soundtracks too. Just had to mention that. Yeah, you know, Gunn is a, a purveyor of. Um, Gunn and Tarantino are the two that where you you go. They have the soundtracks and Edgar kind Wright. of like mesh perfectly. Edgar Wright, I'd say, is a is a strong. Edgar Wright is another one. Yes, Ed, yeah. uh, baby, um, baby driver. Baby driver. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that was an interesting look into this week's big news. Mm. Um, let's talk about let's talk about Bond stuff because we're of course in Bondathon. Uh, yep. We have done Connery. We have done Lazenby. We have done Roger Moore. Tonight we do Timothy Dalton. He's right there. He's in the back. You know, just going around the going around the circle. Um, and the movie we're doing tonight is The Living Daylights, which, as it turns out, is Timothy Dalton's first uh, Bond esca escapade, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have to be honest here. I have not seen this movie in a long time. And I really liked it. I mean, it's long. Um, yeah, it's only two hours, ten minutes, which. But it feels longer. Um, oh yeah, it, they do. A, there's a lot of plot in this, and I'm I'm actually liking. I like dense. almost all of this movie. Um, it, it definitely feels like an old school Bond or a, a literature derived Bond. The literature Bond. derived Bond. Now that's because that's one of the interesting things. It's one of the few Bond movies that take a title from a, from a from an Ian Fleming uh, it's actually from an Ian story. Fleming short story, right? I mean, and he most didn't of the it was Octopussy, Living Daylights, Property of a Lady, Quantum of Solace and um, James Bond in New York, which why, why, have we, why have we never gotten that? Um, I'm just saying that's an easy sell. Bond in Times Square. Um, okay. They well, could have used it for living or for living my die that we talked about last week. They they could have. Um, <laughs> what I would say though that I think is interesting here. Um, uh, so you know you had a lot of people coming and going on this one. So it's the last time we're ever going to hear John Barry score a Bond film. Um, we actually have a new Money Penny in this one, and then we also have a new Bond. Now, the real interesting thing comes in the sidelight, the production side of things, right? Where we we start all of our shows every week when we jump in. Um, production is messy early because because of Remington Steel. Let's just 
we'll call we'll call uh, you know a spade a spade. Remington Steel uh, causes Bond to be held up. Brosnan, our next Bond, to be held up from Timothy Dalton. And what happens is they have a uh, first off, Remington Steel gets canceled. Brosnan goes and has a three day uh, audition with the Broccoli's. They like him as Bond. They're going to put him on as Bond. Everything goes well. Three days before a contract comes due, NBC, um, realizing first off that there was now renewed interest in Remington Steel because it was about to star a Bond, and two, because they had a contract, um, like a liner that basically stated that they could call him back at any point before this three day period was over after the audition. Option. And yeah a standard option and they basically do it and they put Remington steel back on the television. It was about to be canceled. And the interesting thing here is it, it costs Brosnan the role because the broccoli family can't feel that bond would be somebody that's also on television. So Brosnan loses out on the role because NBC pulls a, a fast one, a quick one, so to speak. Now he's not the only person to lose a role. And we're not talking about Living Daylights here. Stephanie Zimbalist, who was trying to make the jump from movie, from television to movies, also in a slight weird thing, because this show gets pulled back, and by the way, only five episodes are made, because once he's no longer Bond, there is no interest in Remington Steel, which is like this weird catch-22, right? Yeah, Stephanie that's... Zimbal- that that season, and I speak as somebody who's you know binge watched all of Remington Steel a couple of times over the years. Five episodes. That yeah, they're they were kind of like TV movies almost. You know, they were two hours each. Uh, they were broken up into you know two you know parters for syndication, and it's really crappy. It's and they really look crappy. mad. They both they look, look mad. Really and they look mad. They look angry. Yeah, and the I two of them like, look angry. They're they're no longer. Because Stephanie Zimbalist, I don't know if you know this, but this is a slight trivia question. She was originally up for the role that Nancy Allen played in um, RoboCop. So she was going to play the the cop in RoboCop and would have been able to jumpstart a movie career for herself. Mm-hmm. But because his contract was called in, so was hers. So they both lose out on the opportunity to go into the big screen they're forced back into five Remington Steel episodes and they're angry as piss. The two of them are just angry. Uh, this leads to other other actors, other other possibilities, um, including Timothy Dalton, who's coming from a, a Shakespeare background. Also up for the role at that point. Um, fun stuff. I mean, Sam Neill is one of the ones that's that's main, mainly talked about as somebody that had a shot at this point. Uh, Sam Neill reading uh, plenty of times for the role in Living Daylights. Um, and then also um, a, a fun one, one that I look at and I go, that would have been an interesting, well, two fun ones, actually. One, um, Brian Brown. Okay. Who Who is a really interesting, like, because, uh, you know, he made... A movie called FX in the '80s. That's or FX and FX2, which are these fun little thrillers about, um, you know, a special effects guy that's brought into a, like a murder plots. Um, and the other big one that got that got a look, but then they walked away from was this guy named Mel Gibson. Um, so Mel Gibson could have been Bond at this point, but they liked Dalton enough that Dalton comes in and, and Dalton, yeah. um, my favorite thing. Way. Go ahead. Uh, this is, this came out like right at the same time. The lethal, the first lethal weapon was 87 as well. Right. Yes. So if they had gone with, um, Gibson, no, no lethal, lethal weapon. weapon. Um, if, if flash Gordon in 1980 had been more popular and they actually did a succession of sequels, like one or two, Maybe uh, Timothy Dalton, who was Prince Baron in in the that film, and would have returned for those sequels. Maybe that would have turned them off from hiring him for this too. Um, there's always so many weird little eddies and ripples where things have to happen. 
a bunch make... of things that have to happen for, for it to work. Yeah. And Dalton, here's an interesting thing. I Dalton comes into it and he doesn't want to be Connery, doesn't want to be more. Um, and what I would say is the most interesting thing about his casting is that he he had read the Ian Fleming books. So when he comes into the the auditions, he had read the Ian Fleming books. So he was like he was well prepared and had an idea that Bond, like I, I read his take on it. It's it's a real interesting take. Um, where he basically says, um, I felt it would be wrong to pluck the character out of thin air or to base him on any of the other predecessors' interpretations. Instead, I went in, I went to the man who created him, and I was astonished. I'd read a couple of books many years ago, and I thought to find them trivial now, but I thoroughly enjoyed them, every one I read. It's not just that they're a terrific sense of adventure and you've gotten very involved. On those pages, I discovered a bond I'd never seen on the screen. A quite extraordinary man, a man I really wanted to play, a man of contradictions and opposites. The idea that Bond is somebody that is on the string, uh, like on the the razor's edge of life. And mm-hmm. the reason he has to drink and smoke and drive fast cars and drive fast women is that he is constantly faced with death. Which, of all the Bonds that I've ever seen, I've never actually seen as good a interpretation of Bond. Yeah, I, And the more I watched The Living Daylights, the more I thought to myself, we kind of missed it with this one. We missed out on the, like, for whatever reason, mm-hmm. this guy didn't get enough Bond movies um, to, to, to figure out everything about it. But I, I found myself rewatching this one going, like, originally thinking, it's very low on my list, right? And then going into it and watching it and coming out of it going pretty good bond not there are problems obviously um it's not a perfect bond but you know bond girls kind of like uh villains uh um aha song is uh oh but, i think that's one of the worst bond uh theme songs so. <laughs> it's it's uh i i didn't mean meh. i meant uh um aha doing a song is just never um, it could have been the Pretenders, Rich. Could have been the Pretenders. Um, Pretenders have the other song on the soundtrack, which is a little bit better, the love theme at the end. But, mm-hmm. you know, you have all these different little pieces. It all starts with the casting. Um, it has a great, it does have a good director, a good Bond director in John Glenn. They film on location at the Rock, the Rock, the Rock of Gibraltar. Um, so it has the location shoots that you would want in a Bond film, Right. Also filming in the desert. Um, I also, when you went into this one, Rich, did you remember that the Mujahideen were good? Were good in this one? <laughs> there um, are a lot of elements in old Bond movies that do not age well, but boy, oh boy, is that this one kind of like a yikes! <laughs> that was just a shocker, and also the woman is not doesn't have to wear a burqa at all. Um, I was yeah. I was shocked because you know my de Bo. Um, but yeah, you we, know, this is also one of the. This is the last time the Bond franchise can really deal with the Soviet Union as the bad guys. Uh, this is 1987. Fall of the Soviet Union's like 90, 1990, 91, just a few years away. And you know, the next Bond movie down the road, you know, is when has I th- nothing to do with world politic, and. Um, probably because the situation was so volatile, they didn't want to be dated by the time the movie came out. So it's when I think I think they pick up a good point. point. They're in Afghanistan, uh, fighting against the Soviet invasion. So obviously, we're going to support them. And you know, of course, that would the rebels. We're supporting the rebels, who later on, as Americans and as British, would, you know, we just had a book released by by uh, by the Prince, and basically, basically said, hey. I killed a lot of these guys in Afghanistan. Um, so it's it's a weird kind of um, it's a weird movie specific, you know, change of of direction with regards to actual world politics. But it's I think they do a good a, job. I think the a, script a is movie of its time. Yeah, and it's but the script is tight. I I feel like the script, it, but it's dense, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really dense. But I like the idea that it opens on a pre mission. It op- like. It has a lot of Bond component pieces there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, but it doesn't have other component pieces. Yeah. It, um, 
we're, we're, we're going to go to my bugaboo about Roger Moore as well here. This is our first introduction to a new Bond, and it, there's not like an iconic reveal. He's just kind of like there, you know, with all the other guys on the thing. And it's fine. <laughs> I mean, the overall sequence is fine. It just doesn't give us a really good... Well, well, I kind of a moment. I, I understand what you're saying. I actually found it really. I, I found it, it kind of. He does have a good reveal when he kind of turns around and he's in the full black and he's, you know, he's one of the only ones that actually makes it to where they're supposed to go. There, I think they're they're testing a defense system or security system, and then of course everything kind of gets turned on on its head. It is, um, you know, Smirsh uh, is r- written into the concept as well. It, they do everything they can uh, with the Soviets. I, I think it's interesting because, you know, we're talking about near the fall of the, the the Berlin Wall. We're talking about the fall of the Soviet Union. They do a good job of trying to incorporate that into the screenplay mm-hmm. where they're, they're you know, and, and, and the actor gets older. They can't portray people as much. So we get a whole round of new, uh, new character actors to play Russian KGB agents, including John Rice davies Um and you know, and uh, and crab, right? Um, mm-hmm. So I, it's 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 fine. Production goes fine. It, there's no, again, this is a whole movie that's dominated by the casting. And once you get past the casting, everything kind of falls into place. I mean, you know, they just they cast Dabo, who who had been up for a role in View to a Kill and didn't get it. Um, you know, and Glenn does a pretty good job, you know, directing and the filming. Um, a lot of it's filmed on sta- uh, 007 stage at Pinewood Studios. They do some location stuff. Um, they have some interesting, um, you know, principal photography basically goes without a hitch. Uh, and all these different pieces go into place. Um, the, other, the other two things are... Um, that in production that come up are that aha doesn't get along with John Barry, which is a kind of a funny headline. And they also uh, renegotiated a deal with Aston Martin to bring the Aston Martin back. So we get a brand new Aston Martin, which will launch will be part of our legacy segment later. As we talk about bond and his car, which is almost as important as bond and his ladies or bond and his drink. Um, and we had some other things. So let's see. What yeah. We got, um, I will say too. I think you know, this is the worst Felix Leiter that we get. Oh, this Felix, this Felix Leiter is like television Felix Leiter. He's yeah. like a TV, a TV Hasselhoff version of the uh, Felix Leiter. Um, Sean writes, "I love. I mean, I love Bond films, but Dalton in my opinion was not my favorite. I don't think he got a chance to be your favorite, and that's something I'm going to talk about the legacy or later." I, I know this sounds weird, Sean, but as I was rewatching this movie and somebody who's watched all the Bond films, and I don't know how Rich feels about this, but I feel like, I feel if we had given him three or four movies, we might have actually, we might be sitting here talking about how much we love Timothy Dalton as Bond and how he got him, you know, he kind of, like imagine if Dalton had gotten to do Goldeneye after mm-hmm. he'd done the first two that he had done. And because go, Goldeneye is, uh, is one that everybody talks about, right? Um, imagine if he had gotten to do Goldeneye or the world is not enough. And all of a sudden his four bond movies are now, you got this one's pretty good. You have license to kill, which is original at least. And then you have the golden eye, which would, would have been probably his best. And, and he would have been feeling the character by that, at that point. Um, let's see. Joe writes bond takes Manhattan. And then Sean wrote, it would be interesting that and arms play Paloma and no time to die become the next bond. No, I don't want her to become the next Bond, Sean. I'm going to disagree with you. I want her to be the next Paloma. I want her to have her own... I want her to show up like Felix Leiter shows up. Don't you, Rich? Don't you? Isn't that what you want for her? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. It, it, bring her back. Her sequence in No yeah. Time to Die is like is one of the best parts of the entire mm-hmm. movie. Um, but I understand what you're saying. I, I don't want her to be somebody else. I want her to be her own person. So production happens. It goes fine. Again, all stemming from uh, how how this bond is going to be received and how this bond got his job. Box office, Rich. So, looking at the numbers, 
first off, anything over a view to a kill is, is higher, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it it has it does very well in 1987. Uh, it opens on July 31st, 1987. It it goes up against the Lost Boys, Rich, which I had no idea opened so low. It opens against the Lost Boys and beats the tar out of the Lost Boys by almost doubling up the Lost Boys. So this movie opens on July 31st, 1987 to 11.5 million, 11.05 million dollars, uh, which is 21% of its total gross in the United States. Um, it, it lasts about five weeks. It opens on 1700 screens, which is a lot of screens. It ends up grossing one, uh, $51 million domestic in the United States, which translates to about 120 million. So a pretty sizable amount of money, right? It it does fairly well. (laughs) It gets back from the horribleness that was a view to a kill, Mm -hmm. which by the way, I was telling you, and we talked about it last week, I rewatched it. It's a bad bond. It's not a good, like Roger Moore's pudgy. It's, it's not good. No. So two years from now, Timothy Dalton steps into the role and the role has been very much uh, Roger Moore down. Right. Cause Moore at the end is, is old. He's out of shape. He's hitting on women half his age. It's, it's, it's brutal. And Dalton steps in and he's, he's young and he's attractive. He's, he's got the right, he's got the right props. Um, the movie grosses an astounding $191 million worldwide, which is a, a lot of money, Rich, in 1987. Um, and only 51 is from the United States, which is wild. Because as we progress through these Bond movies and we get to the uh, we get to the Brosnan Bonds and we get to the uh, we get to the Nicholas, uh, the Daniel Craig Bonds these box office performances are going to get higher and higher as the nostalgia and the love for the character grows. So it, it ha- does very well with Connery Moore has an early good start and then kind of falls off. Mm-hmm. Dalton has a, uh, you know, kind of in the middle uh, of the bullseye. Brosnan has early success and then trails off. Craig has minimal success early and then trails up. Uh, to to eventually becoming the first bond bond film to have successive billion dollar bond films, um, or at least one or two billion dollar bond films uh, under his under his you know under his belt. But this Dalton doesn't really get a shot, and the box office is is good again compared to View to a Kill, which I think is really yeah. interesting. But it only lasts about five weeks in theaters. And again, there's a little bit of competition in 87. We're talking like yeah. Lost Boys and a couple crazy. of other movies. Yeah. <laughs> yes, 87 is a crazy uh, summer. Um, As we mentioned, but I think we had... Um, but that's about, the, that's about the story of the box office. Um, the question becomes next, how was it received? How was this new... Fresh, young Bond received, Rich. And the answer to that is, um, eh, meh. There's yeah. a definite, like, um, they notice, like, one of the things that's all, that's present in almost all of the reviews is that he is fresh and that he has a, there's a certain swagger to him that's different from Roger Moore. And again, that's more an old age thing with Roger Moore. But the film, um, as we're looking at Rotten Tomatoes, right? Film only gets a 73% score on Rotten Tomatoes as of right now. 66% audience score, which is, again, right in line. Mm -hmm. Um, So the reviews are not, they're not kind, but they're also not scathing. And I would say that's a step up, considering that the reviews for View to a Kill were scathing. Right? View to a Kill is widely regarded as one of the worst Bond films. Um, even though it had a good villain and a good and a good Bond girl. 
um, and a good and a banging song. Like that is one of the rare occasions where it's a Bond film that has terrible Bond, terrible film, good Bond girl, good Bond villain, great Bond song, mm-hmm. and it's a disaster. But this one song isn't great. Aha doesn't really pull anything out. Like they thought they were gonna have a much better um Duran Duran type uh reception. But it's a mess song. It's a bad song. It's a boring song, Rich. Like, um, but the critical reviews are all uh, you know, everything's two stars usually. The the two I came up with were the Roger Ebert reviews, were basically they were looking at it going basically looking at it and saying Hey, you know, he's okay. It doesn't have any of the humor. I, uh, uh, actually, this is perfect. Ebert says, Living Daylights was two stars out of four. He criticized the lack of humor in the protagonist. So Dalton doesn't have a sense of humor, which was becoming a recurring theme under in his, in his Bond worldview. And then he feels General Whitaker was uh, not one of the great Bond villains. He's kooky, phony general who plays with toy soldiers and never seems truly diabolical without a great bond girl, a great villain or a hero with a sense of humor. The living daylights belong somewhere on the lower rungs of the bond ladder, but there's some nice stunts, (laughs) which I think is like, that's Ebert's way of saying you might like it. You might. Uh, And I would argue that I would argue that the stuff in, in living daylights for me, I, I love the, the ski sequence. On the cello, I, I was midway through. I was going, "This is ridiculous," but then, like, yeah, but it's a Bond film, so I'm okay. Um, and the car chase. There's a car chase in the middle. Um, that's in snow. That's really a lot of fun. Where they're, you know. Now, now you see, the, we're talking about the car chase with the laser and everything else, and yeah, like the, lasers. No, that took Don't me like out of the movie. movie. Actually, everything it felt like a very grounded espionage '90s, uh, you know, late '80s, early '90s film, and I was like, "Yeah, okay, I can see this." I kind of, you know, like you know, rolled my eyes a little bit at the Q sequence because, the Q, you know, whenever we're in Q's lab, it's it it's gotten to the point where it feels like we're there more for a couple of jokes, a couple of bit of slack. It's money. It's Monty Python level of uh, danger humor. Yeah, like it's. As like the, there to, is the, like, the the couch eating someone or somebody blowing something up from across the room where you're just the like ghetto blaster this is the ghetto blaster that's lame, but the Aston Martin is nice, Rich. I like and yeah. and I'm but, a big fan when they have like stuff that that's throwback stuff where you go, well, we had an Aston Martin at one point and he, you know replaced it and I like when we get back to stuff where it's like that. But you're right, the the laser and the ro- the rockets. There's rockets. There's all kinds of cool shit in the car. I was, I was, I was, I played a lot of, uh, do you remember Spy Hunter, the video game? I oh, was yeah. waiting for the bond, this bond car to have an oil slick. Cause <laughs> that would have been perfect. Cause it would, it would have looked just like that car would add the shooters. And then it could also been the car from, from Spy Hunter. I, I learned to drive playing Spy Hunter. So, you know, <laughs> who didn't, Oh wait, uh, uh-huh. young people may be watching the show. Um, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. There is a grounded take to the material, right? There's no, and I agree with Roger E, but there is no real Bond villain. So that's, that's a big concern for me. The Bond villains are, they're interchangeable here. Although there's a really nice, there's a really nice, um, I like the sociopath. I like, Mm -hmm. I like the henchman. Uh, he will also, I believe he also turns up in Die Hard, right? Um, Andreas Wisniewski. Yeah. He plays a character called Necros, um, who is Koskov's henchman. Um, and he, and he's threat. There is a, there is an air of, uh, sociopathic. He cuts a swath through the movie where like when he shows up, he's constantly, uh, either choking people out or killing them and then walking away and getting in an ambulance. He's constantly, Mm -hmm. that's his big move is, you know, but I kill somebody like, and the, while we're talking about this guy, I do like that this movie makes some of the other MI6 agents also fairly competent. The fight that you know the henchman gets into in the kitchen, in the kitchen. and you know it's an good unnamed, fight. 
Yeah, it's a five, six minute fight. It's an unnamed uh, a character. We don't know. You know, he's just random MI6 guy who happened to be in the kitchen. But we stay on this fight for a while, and yeah, you know, it has boiling fight. water. It has it has pots and pans. It has kitchen knives. It's they a good fight. Have an excuse to have Bond there instead, but they didn't. They just said, "Okay, no, he, he fights just this random guy," and you know, you're still invested in it. Um, Saunders, who um, is Bond's contact in this movie, in uh, what was it Vienna? Um, also he's competent. Here. He's super confident. He's he and he's annoyed. He's Bond annoyed shit. with 007. He he'll disagree with Bond, um, but he's not proud enough to go to you know to be able to change his mind and go. You know what? You're right. We're gonna do this instead. And I really like that character. And I hate I hate that he gets killed. But that's good filmmaking. If they made me upset that this like minor character who's generally yeah, cannon fodder. I, modern, I think there is a. I think there is a. I think there's one of the things that's happened with them when you're talking about like the car or like this the, the objects right that are that Bond uses in the movie and stuff like that. I think what happened is when the Moore films started relying too heavily on the gadgets, right? Mm -hmm. And then this one, they want him to have a little bit of gadgets because that's part of that's part of the allure of a Bond film is what's the cool shit that Q's going to give him? And it's usually like one thing a movie now. Now we've gotten into a, a steadfast, like, like, and Skyfall, it become like when we get to uh, Craig, Skyfall's best weapon he gets is that he gets a gun that only has his thumbprint. Yeah. Right? So it can't be used against him. So, I mean, we get Which into- Which isn't really much of a gadget. We have the, that kind of technology already. It's just- But the that's what I mean. That's where we jump forward. I do yeah. like that the car has rockets. I do like, I, I love, I do love the, I, I fell in love with the, the chase sequence down the hill. I felt absolutely, I was, I, I was thinking to myself, this is ridiculous. But then midway through, I'm like, but it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. he, like, like Annie he, he, Dalton gets one good quip where he's like, we're lucky we brought the cello. Like, I mean, he yeah. gets his one and it's not like a lame double entendre. It's a, it's a legit, like, I'm so glad we brought your stupid fucking cello that I totally believe. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I it, it all, also at the end of it, you know, we have nothing to declare. Yeah. And he, and, and yeah, underneath, underneath the, underneath the pole, like a limbo stick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I thoroughly enjoyed that. I enjoyed this movie more than I thought I was going to, if that sounds weird. Cause I, I have in my head that I didn't enjoy the Dalton bombs. And it could be, and and this is, I'm going to say this to you as a film historian, and me and you are around the same age. Part of the problem with The Living Daylights and License to Kill is simply the years they get released, right? They get released in 87 mm -hmm. and 89. Yeah. So you get, in 87, you have, that's the summer of Lethal Weapon, Robocop, mm -hmm. so many things. Lost Boys, all these movies come out in 87. Great movies that come out in 87. 89 is the summer of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Lethal Weapon 2, and uh, I don't know, this small com uh, non-commercial film with a guy who flies around Gotham City. And so all of a sudden... Well, also 89 was what? Ghostbusters 2, Honey, I Shrunk the Kid... Um, Dead Poet Society, do the right thing. Yeah, some are, yeah. I, I think I think part of the reason that Dalton gets forgotten, and it's not really fair to Dalton. And I'm gonna I'm gonna you know I'm hope springs eternal for me with Dalton now, right? One of the reasons Dalton gets forgotten about is simply that the sheer volume of things that he was up against that happened to take the zeitgeist, right? I mean, I think it's that's part of it. So when mm -hmm. somebody says, oh, he's not my, you know, we were talking to Sean earlier and we also had another comment. Let's see. We have a comment from uh, Sean again. Uh, okay. I, I agree with you on that. Where it was like, we we're talking about what we we're talking about that Paloma should have her own thing. But what I was saying to Sean, he's probably not your favorite bond because he didn't one, he didn't get enough bond films. No. And two, the years his movie came out, there were so many other things that if you're a bond fan, you go to see the bond movie, $51 million, a lot of money for a bond film. 
right? In in eight in the eighties. That's a lot of money for a Bond film. Mm-hmm. And then it grows 141 worldwide, right? Or 140 worldwide. Um, but because of what it's up against in the eighties, you might have forgotten about it. Like, think about it. I wasn't I remember a summer of 87 going to my going with my father to the circle drive-in and we saw RoboCop and Lethal Weapon on a double bill. Wow. And if you go to a, a drive-in with your dad and see RoboCop and Lethal Weapon, the furthest thing from your mind is the living daylights. It's the furthest thing from your mind, Rich. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing you can do about it because all you're watching Lethal Weapon and you're watching RoboCop and they're two of the greatest action films ever made. You know, one's sci-fi action, one's a regular cop movie. They're two of the greatest movies ever made. And so you had all this competition. And then 89, it just gets worse for oh. Timothy Dalton. And, and they get he gets put into a Bond film that isn't really, it's more of a revenge film and not a Bond film. So you now you have, you have extraordinary factors. And then all of a sudden he's not Bond anymore. And, mm-hmm. and... Yeah, and that and that's again that's, weird. that's totally that's entirely out of Dalton's hands. You know, they, they signed him to a seven year contract. He does two movies. Eon Productions, who are the ones who make this, and MGM are the ones who are distributing it, get into a TIFF. The TIFF doesn't get resolved until about ninety one, ninety two. At this point, Dalton's contract is pretty much expired. And he's like, guys, I've kind of moved on. Uh, which is a shame because you know they were working on at least two different Bond scripts um, for the next one. Uh, one was um, called R- uh, Reunion with Death. The other one didn't have a um, title officially, but some people say it might have been you know going under the name Property of a Lady, which is another one of the short stories from the Octopussy uh, collection. And um, You so know, the TIFF I, happens. I, I've read, I've read the, like the treatments for those, and they're okay. I'm sure they would have, you know, been whipped into better shape, you know, as the pro- writing process went on and everything. Um, and it's it's a shame because they really wanted to continue with Dalton, and then yeah, some of the elements wound up in like Goldeneye and. Um, well, and also the other thing that happens is somebody is no longer Remington Steel, and somebody is no longer under contract to NBC. Yeah. So it. It it all it all goes it all goes against Dalton in every conceivable way, which is kind of sad. Uh, let's see, Dustin uh, Ken writes, Dalton never really be known as 007 more than the voice of Mister Pickle Pants. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I would also say he's he actually found a really true calling playing villains, right? In in the Rocketeer, he was a tremendous oh, Errol God. Flynn substitute, amazing. Mm-hmm. And, then, and you know, I would also put out to you. Don't wouldn't you at some point, Rich, like to see him play? We've never had a Bond play a villain. I would love to see Dalton go up against a new Bond. I think Dalton, an aging Dalton, would make an excellent Bond. Oh villain. gosh, yeah, be super cool. Also, to get him back, um, Sean, you can only have uh, one as the next John- Bond. Who do you choose? <sighs> this is now, Sean. You're jumping into the show. This is a whole reason why we're doing our bondathon, right? So, Sean, you've asked the the impren- the the question on everybody's mind, but also the reason we're we're doing this bondathon is because we're getting ready to have Bond announced. And who do I FBI choose? Probably. Who do I choose? I I don't know. I I feel, and I have reasons for a lot of things. I don't know how Rich feels. I'm gonna, we're going to get to it in a second. I have. I feel Hardy would be too much like Craig. And I feel Hardy's a little too old. I feel uh, Cavill has a lot of other things to do. And he, I, he's I just doing, feel he's I, doing Warhammer. He's happy with that. I, I feel he's I feel he's out. Has to do um, I I think somebody like I think like I like the kid from Bridgerton because I think he'd be an interesting. He's young enough. He's got the look. He's got built in. He's got it. I'll give you an example of where Broccoli can make a huge, a huge thing. If you cast the guy from Bridgerton, you not only get me and Rich going to see a Bond movie, but you get our good friend Natasha going to a Bond movie. Super excited about Bond. And that ha- hasn't happened for a lot of ladies going to Bond movies in a while, right? Um, so I, I like him. I also like, I think Aaron, T- Alan, Aaron Taylor Johnson could be interesting as well, because I think he's got. 
he's beefed up certainly, but he's got a bunch of projects too that are all like, you know, he's working on Craven and he's working on this and that. And mm-hmm. so I, you know, there's a lot of these young actors are already very well spoken for, but I like the kid from Bridgerton. I, I feel he stayed away from stuff. Um, recently, if you're paying attention, he hasn't really done a lot of things recently. And my guess would be he's been, he's been at least approached. Rich, what do you think? Who are your, who are your, uh, your one choice? I'll take the kid from Bridgerton. Ideally, I'm stealing a time machine and going back in time, getting a young Alan Rickman. Wow, that would have been interesting. Fantastic Bond. Um, and it's just, you know, quirk of fate. You know, we got a great film. Is your time, is your time machine a DeLorean? <laughs> because I think that's everybody's choice for time machine. Um, no. um, I think I think Sean means now, but I like yeah. Alan Rickman theory. I, I I was I was exploiting a loophole there. Um, I know he has to should be British or you know from Great Britain, England, Wales, um, Scotland, Ireland. Um, and in um, one case, Australia. Um, but honestly, let's try an American actor. And I think um, Alden Ehrenreich could be a good James Bond. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I feel he has too much baggage for the Broccoli's to sign off on that. Uh, because, I feel of, like, uh, Solo. because of Solo. Mm-hmm. I feel he has too much baggage because he gets he gets blamed for Solo. But I'll, I'll approve your... I, I, I actually think the kid got a bummed rap. I actually like Solo. I don't think Solo is as bad as everybody think it is. So I like your pick. Um, it is as bad as everybody else says it is, and, but none of that is really his fault. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I think I think the kid. I think the kid from Bridgerton. I think if you throw him into the role, one you you get your first black bond. You also get I think the crossover. What you're looking for is a bunch of females that want to go to a Bond movie for the first time ever. Right? Yeah. And I think you could pull that off. You pull that off with him. I think Cavill could be interesting, but I think Cavill's got a lot of shit going on. He doesn't really care. Cavill, you know what I mean? Cavill's also, to my mind, too beefy to be James Bond. Um, yeah. I, I feel Bond should be a little bit more wiry. Um, you remember, Sean Connery was cast on the strength of the fact that he kind of you know, walked like a jungle cat. So, but I also think, I think, and that's the same reason I don't cast Hardy, right? Yeah. I don't cast Hardy because I think Hardy's bond would be very similar to Craig's bond. We want a difference, right? Ken chimes in. This is a personal one. Mad at JW for drinking my favorite water store was out. Pineapple cooking. Yeah. Sparkling ice. I'm a huge, that was a, that was a very wise decision. It's, it's sugar free. It's coconut pineapple. It's delicious. Goes well with booze. So, um, <laughs> but also, you know, one of the things that came up uh, as we're talking about the reaction now and then, it is widely regarded. It is a favorite bond now. Um, for example, Rich, if you're looking at it, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, retrospective, in retrospect, right? What we've seen, it is. It's been called uh, the fourth best Bond movie ever by The Independent. Um, it, it's been uh, it's been widely regarded as one of the better Bonds. Um, like it's some uh, IGN and a couple other polls had it as the sixth best Bond film ever made. Uh, the Guardian called it their favorite, one of his favorite Bonds, basically because Dalton is nuanced and it's a different kind of re- version of Bond. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, and that his relationships change and evolve throughout the movie in a different way. So it's, you know, it's definitely, um, it's what it's become much more widely regarded. And if you look at something like cinema score, the cinema score at, rating for this movie is an A, which A's are hard to come by. A minuses occur a lot with blockbuster films. B pluses, but just regular A's are very few and far between. Yes. Um, so with that, with the response, with everything, what's the legacy of this franchise? Well, 
I, one we're never one we're never gonna have John Barry ever again. So this is the last John Barry scored uh, Bond film, which um, is a loss for the franchise. Um, another uh, big thing: uh, the franchise viability is is up because Dalton uh, basically clears the way of the of the more Bonds. He's kind of like his Bond legacy will become a he's like a para aperitif, right? He's like yeah. a tiny bit of brandy after a meal. He's a, and then you go and you hit the, the bar. What was that? He's a palate cleanser. Yes, he's like, he's like a sorbet, he could, a Bond yeah, sorbet. Could, like the last couple of moors were kind of like on an upward trajectory of ridiculousness, and then boom, he's back down to like, no, here's a solid. Oh, I thought you were going. Realistic. I thought you were going upward trajectory of quality. I'm like, they're no, on no, a no, downward no. trajectory of quality. He, no. And his movies upward shoot right up. Crap. <laughs> and then boom, we're back down to. Here's a solid, rounded espionage story that doesn't have too much silliness in it. There's a few moments. And an interesting take on Bond. It's because he's I a don't... quiet, reserved Bond, which yes. I, I, it doesn't really help him to state his case, but also he's given interesting... It's a different kind of Bond movie. And I would argue that once on rewatch, it becomes a much... Like, I'm going to put it, it's going to be in my top 10, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's definitely going to be ahead of some of the more bonds. A lot of the more bonds, actually, which going into this, Rich, I wasn't expecting. Um, you know, the other legacy here is that um, the Broccoli saw something they wanted and they didn't get it. And usually rich people, Rich, uh, yeah. get, what they get what they want, right? The, the the legacy here is that they saw Brosnan enough in these in these auditions that the moment that these two movies get made and don't do as well as they should, even though we're not looking at all the other side side reasons why they didn't do as well or how they could have done better if they had different you know time frames that were released or anything like that, Dalton takes the blame for it, and the bra and Brosnan comes on board because he doesn't. Like he doesn't, he hasn't given material that's bondy enough. If that makes any sense, like he mm. doesn't get material that's that's so like. Granted, the cello sequence should be bondy enough for most people. I would, and, it, and for it, me, it, it was like a Roger Moore sequence. It does, but he's so he's so. Um, I don't know. I really enjoyed it, and, and what I would say to you is, he's so casual and calm during it. And that line, the sequence is like, I'm so glad you brought the cello. Like, it's just, it, it's not a joke. He delivers it in a non-jokey fashion. And I really, I looked at it and go, this is ridiculous, but it is a Bond movie. It's only, a, they only have to go a mile, right? Like, they're going downhill. Like, I, I immediately came out of it going, I don't hate this movie. <laughs> and I actually liked it more than I thought, of, like, I, more than I ever remembered liking it. Um, and, I thought that was amazing. And I think he's, he would have been a great, he could have been the legacy for me is the missed legacy, right? The yeah. idea that he could have been a, a great bond with three or four movies or just a little bit more behind him and not necessarily what happened to him. Um, and also the, the franchise viability goes, it goes, it goes without saying, um, you got to have at least three out of the four. You got to have three out of the four elements to make a Bond movie. You got to have a great Bond, mm -hmm. a great villain, a great Bond girl, and a great song. Or you got to have some combination of those for it to last in the memory. And this movie has one thing going for it, which is Dalton's interesting take on Bond. And everything else is kind of like the Bond girl's meh. You know, blonde cellist. Eh. The villain is really super bleh, right? It's not not good. Um, and the song is abhorrent. It's like <laughs> the opposite. It's like the opposite of View to a Kill, right? It's it's like the opposite of the Duran Duran banger. It's it's like I, the I anti banger. This, I will say this for the theme song. I am really glad um, DVDs and Blu-rays come with chapter stops so you can skip ahead to things. Because I think every time I've ever revisited this movie on home video, 
It's bloop right over that song. I, it's just not good. I'm not going to spend three minutes to finally like listening to it. My apologies to everybody named in the credits. Uh, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but <laughs> I am not listening to that song. I've got a so there's a legacy right there, where <laughs> where where a a film historian like yourself avoids a Bond song. It doesn't happen too often recently. I mean, the Bond songs lately have been, you know, Billie oh, yeah. Eilish is really good, um, and it's kind of I, like I think the people. You know, one of the things that comes out of this is they they were trying to copy Duran Duran, and have like a, a you know big uh, Euro you know, response, yeah Euro pop thing to it. But the thing here, you know, when when if somebody gets picked for a Bond song, they have to bring out, they have to be good, they have to they have to be the best that they can be, and that's why you get an Adele and you get you know you get a Sam Smith and you get Billy Eilish and the people who've been doing the Bond songs lately are all. Like they're great songs, like they're amazing mm-hmm. songs. Um, but uh, you know, my saddest part of the legacy is that he doesn't get fair. I I don't think he gets a fair run, but it's, that's just me. it's the legacy that we don't get, as you said. Yes, it's it's like a missing. It's it's a weird thing, and that doesn't happen that often, where you get missing legacies with Bond films, right? I mean, um, some comments. Let's see what else we got. We got. Um, ooh, well, that's interesting. do you think Robert Pattinson can pull it off? Yes, but he's super busy now because he's playing mm-hmm. another, uh, you know, another sociopath, uh, <laughs> that, that kills a lot, that doesn't necessarily kill people, but solves a lot of the world's biggest crimes. Um, Pattinson, I think, could pull it off. Pattinson, when you watch a lot of the Pattinson movies, like when people were worried about the Batman casting. Um, I always, I always try to find a movie. Like when people, I'll give you an example. I was sitting next to my good friend, Ren Schmidt. I don't know what movie we were watching at midnight, but the Affleck news came out and we're sitting in at Cinemark in Pennsylvania and the Ben Affleck news came out and he was so upset about Ben Affleck. And I'm like, but you know, we just went to see the town two months ago and the town is literally Batman when he's robbing crime, when he's doing the crimes (laughs) <laughs> and Bruce Wayne when he's not doing the crimes, so he can do it. Same thing with Pattinson. When people are like all upset about Pattinson, oh my God, Twilight's going to be Batman. It's not going to work. Yeah, but he's done other movies, Good Time and he and Cosmopolis, mm-hmm. <laughs> where you when sit I, back. So I think I, Pattinson could pull off Bond, but I don't think yeah. he's going to. No, but when I see people do that, you know, and refer to oh. What do you mean the Twilight dude is going to be in... Um, Sparkle Vampire. It was always yeah. Sparkle Vampire. In, ba- in the Batman. I'm just like, you guys just need to see more movies. You know, <laughs> look at the outside of big franchises and see what else they do. Um, well, and the thing is, Pattinson and then maybe you paid won't be for... Because this goes all right. the way back. He Ooh. paid for houses and houses for his mother with Twilight. But then he went on a rugged, I'm going to work with as many... Uh, young directors and directors as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so Pattinson, I think Pattinson could pull off Bond. Yeah, Pattinson, I don't think he will. Pattinson has the exact same kind of F you money that like the kids from Harry Potter have where they can go off, do a little weird ball, ball independent. Yeah. Like Swiss blade, Ma- Swiss blade man. And, and he's fine. He's wonderful. Great American accent. Um, and oh, yeah, you've seen the new M. Night Shyamalan yeah, movie, right? Yeah, I, I saw it last night. <laughs> um, when is your embargo up? Uh, I think, no, my, my review's already out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did we like it? Went it went out this afternoon. Yeah. Did we like I it? I liked it. It's probably the best thing that Shyamalan's done um, since he's kind of had, like, this bit of resurgence in terms of, like, starting with, okay. like, uh, The Visitor. Um, okay. Okay. I think it's still not quite as good as I w- what I would consider his trilogy of best work being Six Sense, Signs, and Unbreakable. Okay. But, you know, it's it's that's not too far off. Um, there's some interesting that's, things that's, I think. That's as positive as it. I hear, I hear Batiste is really good, though. I hear he's. Oh, he's fantastic. Yeah, everybody, everybody's saying he has, there's a, there's an ample amount of menace when he, when he's on screen, which is. Uh-huh. Interesting, because he, he, he shot down stuff that he's going to be Bane. So he's like, I'm too old to play Bane now. It's like, really? You're too old too old to work for James Gunn playing Bane, huh? Okay. 
Um, let's see. Uh, Joe also chimes in. James Bond Jr. Sorry, had to. Uh, uh, no, Joe, we're not getting to James Bond Jr. Yeah. If you want James Bond Jr., you're gonna have to go to you're gonna have to go to James Gunn's DC Universe and wait for Damian Damian Wayne to show up. Boom! <laughs> it's like James Bond Jr., but it's Batman Jr. So work with that. Um, if Bond goes younger, Tom Holland. Another actor that's super busy, um, but he would fit into uh, bulking up a little bit. He uh, he would also fit into uh, your wiry frame. Another person that that is up for multiple roles that is looking mighty jacked is Taron Egerton, right? Mm-hmm. Um, he would be a fantastic Bond. He would yeah. be a charming, deadly, but he is apparently up for <clears throat> Wolverine. Apparently, yeah, that's those are the those are the rumors. Mm-hmm. Um, but Taron Egerton would be a good Bond as well. Um, yeah, I think they have to get as far away from Craig as possible. Uh, in the same way that Dalton is as far away from Moore as possible, yeah, and Brosnan is also as far away from Dalton as possible, and then Craig is as far away from Brosnan as possible. Yeah, um, Bond has to change. To, that pendulum has to swing, but it never swings back to where it had been before, which is always interesting. Um, how they managed to do that and managed every every new bond is different and a step away from what was before, but it still ultimately feels like it's all part of the same franchise. Yes. Um, and speaking of the same franchise, mm-hmm. uh, well, Sean has one more comment and then we'll speak about it. Like Panasonic, I think he's a great actor. He is a great actor. Like okay. I, I and like I said, when I, I told people not to worry that the good times and cosmopolis are the two movies good times uh it's either good time or good times i can't remember which one it is I, I, it might not be the s but it's him with his brother who is mentally challenged and they're they rob they they rob a diamond store at the beginning of the movie and the rest of the movie is just him trying to figure out how to get his brother out of trouble and it's a really great movie and cosmopolis is basically uh, Bruce Wayne, if he went on a bender and murdered <laughs> some folks um, and didn't put on a Batman cowl. So, um, yeah, and speaking of uh, speaking of stuff that we're doing. So uh, the living daylights goes away. We, the legacy is an incredible legacy, but also one that's just a missed legacy. Something where you just like look at it and you go, it could have happened, but it didn't. Um, and now we move on. Now, here's where it gets interesting, folks. We have uh, our poll up. Will it be for next week as we progress through our through our Bondathon 2023? Will it be for next week? Will it we be have four choices? Four choices. Goldeneye. Goldeneye. Uh, the world is not enough. Will it be tomorrow never dies? And will it be, oh, where'd the other one go? Oh, there it is. Die another day. And what I would say to you is, in Please all four of those. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. What I, what I would say to you is what you can tell by the poster. So die another day. You have, you have, look at the girls. Look at the Bond girls. Rosamund Pike, Halle Berry. Uh, for Goldeneye, you have, um. Olga, what is it? Olga, mm, damn it. Yeah. Damn it. And Famke Jansen. Mm-hmm. For uh, World Is Not Enough, <laughs> uh, again, please, don't be, don't be mean. This is the worst set of Bond girls we have. Um, and then uh, if you look at Tomorrow Never Dies, you have Terry Hatcher and you have uh, Michelle Yeoh. Uh, you know, the Oscar-nominated Michelle the Yeoh. The Oscar-nominated Michelle Yeoh. <laughs> who is every bit as an equal of Paloma or everybody else. I don't want to sway anything. I, I do. The bras and bonds get are, are okay. And they get progressively worse. Um, so be kind in the voting. Uh, that voting will be in the loud and nerdy group. It will also be on the Indie escape page, which is on YouTube or Facebook. Um, and so those are your choices. You have, you know, some really good choices there. Yeah. Now, JW, um, say you don't want to sway anybody's vote. I do. Please, dear God, please, don't make me sit through uh, Diana, uh, that last one again. That was a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to do 
this again. I just don't want to have to sit there and watch. Well, we it. have people. Uh, Joe is is Joe is trying to sway play. people. Joe is trying to sway people on the India Escape Network with video games. Which, by the way, if you have Xbox or PlayStation, the new Xbox, new PlayStation, you can play a game that's literally thirty five years old. Um, and it's just uh, I've been playing it all week. I can't get through anything. It's so <laughs> fucking hard, Rich. And I'm not talking about like the multiplayer. I'm talking about the actual mission based stuff. The game is so fucking hard and so fucking ridiculous. It's golden eye on Xbox. It's just ridiculous. I've been playing it all week. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's some good, there's some good Brosnan and some bad Brosnan. Be kind with what you're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. Kent, Ken Reds, I like Terry Hatcher. I will take Terry Hatcher all day. Yes. Sure, but I would I would take Michelle Yeoh first. But that's just me. Um, but I like Terry Hatcher. I'm not gonna I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. There are at least three Bond movies that you just saw that have at least decent Bond girls in them. And mm -hmm. one that's just like meh. But big decisions are coming your way. Rich, where can people find you when you're not doing this wacky job with me every week? And also we'll have another announcement after we get all our plugs okay. out. Okay. Plug it all the time. Here we go. Got a lot uh, of plugs. All of my writing can be found at filmbuffonline.com, including uh, my just published review of the new M. Night Shyamalan film, which opens uh, tomorrow night called uh, Knock at the Cabin. Um, also, there is a great breakdown of uh, an analysis of all the new projects that James Gunn announced for this great new, article. This I put new it up on my page. Uh, thing. Um, this was written by my uh, good friend and our film buff, our film buffs, uh, comic book film uh, editor, Bill Gatavaskis. That also went up today. Um, also, another great article that I didn't put up yet. Yes, put up yeah, the, the stuff from the stuff from uh, Tuesday was the news article, and Bill's is more of the analysis. Um, my other podcast, which I do with my co-host and best friend, Natasha Bogutsky, is called The Big Picture Podcast. You can find it at bigpicturepod.com or, again, a link at filmbuffonline.com. Our latest episode broke down all of the Oscar nominations uh, that came out last week. Um, I just recorded a few hours ago a new, pod, uh, new episode of the Philadelphia Film Scribes podcast called uh, – I'm sorry, the Philadelphia Film Critics Circles – podcast called the film scribes in which uh we also do a myself and three other critics do a roundtable discussion about knock at the cabin plus we also talk about uh the um unreleasable uh uh film the people's joker uh which created quite a sensation at um toronto international film festival and if you get an invitation uh, you're lucky to get it yes uh very lucky to have seen it maybe Two to 3,000 people have seen this film all together. Um, you can find Film Buff online at, on Facebook and Twitter. And you can find me personally on Twitter at Film Buff Rich. Wow, that was a lot. Um, so I don't have as much as, as that. I just have find right, me at Loud and Nerdy. We have Loud and Nerdy, the group. Uh, you can find me on Facebook at, at JW the Movie Guy, on Twitter at JW the Movie Guy. Rich does all the heavy lifting. I just kind of show up and talk with him every week and and try to keep things on the rails. Uh, although sometimes I, I force things off on a tangent. Um, but one of the things that we're working on right now, we have two weeks left of our Bonathon 2023. After that, we will start um, a retrospective of Oscar films. That's our big announcement. After we get done with our Bonathon, we're going to work on some Oscar movies. So be prepared. It's going to be fun. We're going to do some... Uh, we're going to look back at some classic Hollywood. We're also going to look back at some current Hollywood. And it should be a really good time. And we're super excited. We're going to name it in a couple weeks. We don't know what we're going to name it. Rich is going to come up with a, a super jazzy name. And we're going to have a good time as we plow through uh, leading up to the 95th annual Oscars uh, coming up. And, and, you know, just over, uh, just over a couple months, um, just over a month, actually. Um, and so we're going to have two months of, of Oscar retrospective after we get done with Bonds. So... Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, yeah. Please pay attention to everything going on in the India Escape Network. We have a new show premiering tomorrow night or Wednesday night. Yeah, t no, Thursday night, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Um, today is it, it, I think, yeah, today is Wednesday. I'm sorry. It, it's been a very long day. I'm not, I'm also like not feeling 
the best. So forgive me on this. Uh, but we have a very, a very cool uh, new show premiering tomorrow night called Sticky Microphone uh, with host Wendy Zier. Uh, and she's a very talented uh, voiceover expert slash actor slash teacher. Uh, so that should be really a lot of fun. Uh, although it is not safe for children, although some people would say our show is not safe for children because, you know, we cause cra- we, we do crazy talk. Uh, but thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. True. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Have a great weekend. Go see some movies. A lot of movies opening this weekend. Enjoy it. Have a good time and watch Poker Face because. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. It's so good. It's it's amazingly good. Um, have a great night. Stay safe. I will talk to you next week for whatever Bond film you choose for us. That polling will be up uh, until Friday at 5 p.m. Have a mm. great weekend.